You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature webcast and podcast series by the Conference Board. Today's program is produced in partnership with the Productivity Institute in the United Kingdom. CEO Perspectives are conversations that take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of timely topics. To help make sense of these topics, we'll sit down with thought leaders and do what we do best at the conference board, provide trusted insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin, the CEO of the conference board and the host of this series. And in today's conversation, we will discuss productivity. It's a topic with many facets that come down to a simple question. Are economies making the most of their human and material resources? Through most of modern history, we've assumed that progress in technology and efficiency will make every person employed and our work more productive over time. Is this a hopeful trend? Is it still holding true? Will it hold true throughout the 21st century? So joining me today is Dr. Bart Van Ark, the Managing Director of the Productivity Institute, which is headquartered at the University of Manchester. He's also the anchor to the Productivity Institute's podcast series, Productivity Puzzles. Bart obviously is no stranger to the conference board. He has been our chief economist for many years, and it's great to have him back. Bart, welcome to the program. Thank you, Steve, and also uh, my welcome to conference board listeners and productivity listeners. Really looking forward to this conversation. So, Bart, you know, you are a globally recognized expert on productivity. Let's just start with what is productivity and, you know, why have you chosen to focus on this as your specialty? Oh, well, we could spend probably our whole podcast on that, what it is and why it is important, but we'll try to, to do it short and brief. So economists have a, a pretty clear cut definition of productivity, which is some sort of measure of output uh, per hour worked or output per worker, the output quite often measured as GDP, as gross domestic product. And then you can make this more refined and you can say, well, we're not looking only at what we produce per, per worker or per hour, but we also look at what uh, the contribution is of machines and technology and so on. And if we take that into account, we have a concept we call total factor productivity. So that's the economics concept. But from a business perspective, it's quite different. To be honest, you know, productivity is actually not a kind of indicator that is daily discussion in the boardroom or that is a key performance indicator. But within the business, people use different metrics. I mean, you know, people on the operation side will use some kind of efficiency metric, quite often linked to particular parts of the product process. Uh, CFOs will look more sort of a cost efficiency. So how efficient are we using our materials and people and everything else? And then human resource leaders will, of course, look more at what is sort of the, the engagement of workers. Are they happy workers? And does that help them to also make them more productive uh, people in the company? So all these perspectives are important. And when you ask me, why, why do I think uh, this is so interesting, is actually trying to bring these various perspectives together, because I think we quite often are missing the sort of narrative around productivity because we're speaking a slightly different language. So, so one thing that we're doing in the productivity institute is try to bring these narratives together so that we understand how we can use our resources in a better way to get more outcomes. Yeah. So basically what you're saying is there are human resources and then there are capital investments, or, you know, whether it's machinery or other forms of resources with an organization. So it's all of those invested resources that produce things, whether it's services or goods, and that's what productivity is. And uh, so, you know, now help us connect productivity to GDP and the output of the N economy. So that's a great question. Uh, in fact, Nobel Prize winner Paul Krugman once said, productivity isn't everything, but in the long run, it's almost everything. And he was right to quite some extent that productivity tends to be a, a concept for sort of longer term economic growth. But on the other hand, it also puts us a little bit on the wrong foot because productivity can actually be really challenging in the short term. And we only have to look at what is happening today with rising cost issues and all sorts of digital technologies coming around. And then we're just coming out of this COVID crisis. So, so in the short term, productivity can really help because if you have rising costs in your organization, you have two options, right? You can either pass that cost on, uh, cost on to your customer or you can improve your cost per unit of output. And that's improving your cost per unit of output is essentially just productivity growth. So what we do think is when you bring these two things together, that productivity is a long-term concept, but you can use it well in the short term, 
that is, as an organization, you really need to invest in sort of that longer term productivity uh, a path in order to be able to deal with short term challenges as you're facing them. And I think right now we're at a time that organizations that have worked on productivity, that have are digital transformed, uh, that have got the right process in place, are much more agile, much more resilient to respond to the challenges that they're facing in the short run. So when you take it to a national level, it's really a collection of all the businesses or, or all the output that uh, is coming out of an economy. And so what I hear you saying is that if you can get more output from the same investment and the same, um, the same human capital, that would be additive to the GDP. Yeah, absolutely. It, 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 it's that investment. It's the human capital. There's also another concept that I think is very important here, and that is what we call sometimes the intangible parts of the economy. It's the digital part of an organization. It's the, it's the management competencies in an organization. It's the way that we are investing in, in, in organizational competencies in an organization. And all these things are coming together. And if all organizations do this well in an, in an economy, it will definitely pay off in, in terms of the macroeconomic uh, growth performance. Yeah, and if you and if you don't get that productivity, essentially you have to scale all of the investment, you know, and it takes more and more capital to uh, to drive the GDP growth. So you really do want to see efficiency come into play here. Um, but there's also the government that plays a role, not just you know, not just the private sector. It's government policy that helps to influence productivity. Can you talk about that? Yeah, government is actually really important in two ways. One, of course, is, of course, that government can facilitate and can improve the conditions under which private organizations can become more productive. But government itself can also be, become more productive. So let's start on the first one of how can government can help. Uh, the, the kind of basic functions that we all know about, right? I mean, you want government to you know, make sure that we have a good education system so that we can get a, a skilled workforce. You want government uh, to make sure that there are investments being made in infrastructure, whether it's roads and bridges or whether it is digital infrastructure and, and access to broadband. Uh, you also want government to make sure that they put the right regulations in place. And by the right regulations, I mean regulations that help to actually use the resources in the most productive way. So you want to have regulations that avoid that we're putting resources there where that you're not going to be very productive. So government can help to facilitate all that. But beyond those basic functions, government can actually be a little bit more interventionist. And we have seen that, for example, also in the US, where uh, the US uh, actually invested quite substantially in technology programs like the space program and the defense program. And that set off a whole lot of uh, uh, new inventions and technologies across the economy. So, th so the government can play an important role there. And the government can also help to diffuse the technology better. So, for example, when governments help to create what we sometimes call regional ecosystems, where business and government and schools and educationists come together in order to make sure that they use the resources as good as possible on the ground. So those are, are, are facilitating uh, roles for governments. Then, of course, government is a big part of the economy, right? So that, that's, that's the other element of it. And, uh, you know, government, therefore, also can do a lot about productivity itself. And we don't always think that, product, that government is very productive. It's very bureaucratic. Things tend to be slow. But if government would make good use of digital transformation, for example, and digital technologies, they can massively improve the productivity compared to what they're doing today. So basically, you know, most economists say that it's less efficient to take dollars out of the private sector, out of the economy and have government redeploy it. But I think what I hear you saying is that there are some investments, when, you know, when you use tax dollars that are raised that are that are beneficial for the economy as a whole, things like, you know, infrastructure capacity. And that's something the U.S. saw in the 1980s, where they they, they grew the capacity of their roads, their bridges, their infrastructure, their rail and so forth. And it, you know, really facilitated GDP growth for the next 20 years. And, and then also you're talking about basic R&D, research and development, which then can be shared uh, more broadly. And, and then, so, th so those are ways, but it, can you just say a few more words about regulation? Because this is a place where, you know, there's some regulation that can be productive, but there's also some regulation that can hurt, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, regulation can absolutely hurt if it makes it more difficult for businesses to get things done. So this is particular 
For example, if you want to start up a business and then you're confronted with all sorts of regulations you need to fulfill to just start up the business. Now, some of that can be good because you want to make sure that the quality of the servers or the goods that are provided are, uh, are of a sufficient nature, but quite often it has more to do with uh, you know, red tape and paperwork. So that, that's an example of a, a place where government doesn't help. However, where government uh, uh, can absolutely help is regulations, for example, that make it easier for businesses to, to get together, to collaborate uh, in particular areas. Um, and, and government can also regulate uh, uh, to make sure that, for example, the digital economy is, is working better and that there are no abuses being made of, of digital platforms and so on. In the competition area, uh, the government has an important role to play to make sure that we continue to compete and that not some firms sort of you know, get such high concentration effects that are making profits that are not in line with the actual investments that are making in an economy. So, as I say, for me, the, for, from a productivity perspective, regulation is really about making making sure that the resources in the economy, people, investments, capital, get allocated to those firms and to those industries where they create uh, most productivity. Yeah. Now, you know, you and I have talked in the past about certain eras where productivity, you know, was very uh, contributory to GDP growth. And I think, you know, we've talked about the, the 1990s generally as a, a period of time where I think you you know you said in the past that it's contributed almost 100 basis points worth of growth. What was it about the, that era, you know, where you saw you know productivity really helping to drive GDP? What was it about it that, that created that productivity? And then why did that go away? Yeah, so, so productivity is not kind of a constant linear trend. It, it's something that really has periods during which it accelerates and periods to, to which it, to, during which it slows down. And a lot of it tends to be related to sort of a new family or a new group of technologies coming together that create a lot of new opportunities for businesses to innovate. So, so for example, if you think in terms of industrial revolutions, there's uh, you know some people saying we're now today living in what we call the fourth industrial revolution, which is the digital age, and and you know and that it has characteristics. That that we have seen in previous industrial revolutions, which means again, technology comes along or, and, and they create a lot of sort of new additional technologies that are happening. And firms slowly start to invest in this because in first instance, they don't necessarily see the opportunities. There may be some pioneering uh, firms that are, are uh, taking some advantages, but the diffusion of technology is relatively slow. However, if this, if this further advances, then these technologies start to spread across the economy. So you get a you're sort of a much greater diffusion uh, of the technology. And once that happens, many more companies are going to benefit. Uh, you then also see that, uh, you know, instead of, you know, new technologies replacing labor, we actually need new labor in order to move these technologies to the next stage. So labor and capital, what we then call as economists, becomes much more complementary. And I think it's really interesting to think about this today because I think we are in this time living now that we see a lot of new technologies coming around, but they seem to still be very concentrated in uh, you know, the digital sector itself or in very large, well-performing firms. But the diffusion of this economy towards small and medium-sized enterprises is still problematic. So we're sort of at the sort of this tipping point in the technology in which we still need to see the productivity growth from digital te technology to spread across the economy. So the 1990s were you know, a, a bit of an anomaly in a way, because you had this, as you say, diffusion of technology, meaning there was a widespread adoption of the use of uh, personal computers and uh, created a great amount of efficiency with the same amount of labor and, and you know, relatively inexpensive technology. So that, uh, you know, that was a great driver during that period of time. You did, Bart, yeah, you did I, it, quite often, yeah. I quite often like to talk about sort of the old digital uh, economy and the new digital economy. So the old, dig the old digital economy is exactly what you just mentioned, the rise of the PC in the beginning right, of the internet. Right. That diffused very rapidly. But yeah. there's these new digital technologies, AI and uh, deep learning uh, technologies that are much harder for companies to adopt. And, and we still need to see the productivity effects from that. Yeah, well, let's, let's come back to that. You've done a great job, Bart, of setting the stage for our listeners on what productivity is and the factors that go into productivity. Uh, after the short break, we'll wind back the clock to the present and discuss where productivity is today. Take a short break and be right back. As war rages in Ukraine, the Conference Board is closely monitoring the situation and producing timely and relevant content on a daily basis that will help the business community navigate this global geopolitical unrest. What will the impact be on oil prices, food prices, our supply chain, and what about cybersecurity? How will this conflict impact the way your organization does business around the world, and how will you communicate this crisis to customers and employees? 
we're gathering the very latest content on our website. Just head to conference-board.org and find trusted insights to help you and your team lead with confidence. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlund, the CEO of the Conference Board, and I'm joined today by our former Chief Economist, Bart Van Ark. Bart is now the Managing Director of the Productivity Institute at the University of Manchester. So, Bart, what are we seeing today in terms of productivity? You know, what are the latest numbers and what's driving it? Yeah, the, the timing for this conversation is great, Steve, because uh, the conference board is actually one of the, the main providers of global productivity numbers. And I was happy to be part of that myself, but also uh, even more happy that it's continued and that actually just uh, uh, a couple of days ago, the latest numbers were, were being released. And um, as great as that is, what we actually saw in the numbers is actually a little bit more uh, worrying because we have really been seeing that uh, you know this long-term slowdown of productivity has temporarily stopped during the COVID crisis, but there is a risk that that slowdown will continue now that we're getting out of the COVID crisis. So just to give you an idea, I mean, uh, globally, productivity output per hour grew by you know, just over 3% in the beginning of this century. It slowed down in the past decade to about 2%. It then quickly picked up in uh, during the COVID crisis, really because we shut down less productive sectors of the economy, like hotels and accommodation. So, you know, you have a lot of people in the room, you send the shortest people out, and then, you know, the average goes up, but nobody gets larger. And and these people, these sectors came back into the room and productivity started to continue to slow. So that's what we're seeing globally. Also in the United States, we see the same thing. You know, productivity growth slowed from 2% to about 1% in the past decade, and it just picked up in 2020, but then it started to slow again. And this is really very timely because now that we're uh, in this sort of new phase where we're seeing supply shortages and, and rising costs, the question really is whether that slowing trend is actually standing in the way of, of responding to to these kind of challenges, or whether you know digital transformation to the extent it has continued during the COVID crisis will put it in a better position to deal with it. I'm still trying to conceptualize sending the shortest people out of the room to drive productivity, but that might be a new concept from Dr. Bart Van Ark. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so you know the cost of labor and the supply of labor has been talked about a lot recently. You know, we we have a bit of a labor shortage right now because of retirements because of people who have taken themselves out of the market due to COVID or other reasons. How does the supply and the cost of labor interact with productivity? So we need to step back a little bit there because uh, it's important how we ended up in this situation of global supply chain disruptions and shortages. And, and the reason we ended up with this is that we've had you know, several decades of a massive globalization that really led to this, what we call fragmentation of production processes around the world. So we were seeking lower cost in, in emerging markets, and we really developed an art of you know, breaking up the supply chain so that we could produce most, efficient, most cost efficient in different places in the world. Now, already in the past decade, we saw that the sort of productivity gains, which were massive, were gradually beginning to come to an end. You can't do this forever. At some time, you get to a point that you can sort of refine that art further. So we already had some concern about the fact that that wasn't going to be to continue to be a driver of further productivity gains. Then COVID hit, so we got uh, supply chain disruption simply because ships couldn't move around the world. And now we see rising costs and other kind of dis disruptions also from the, uh, from the global political uh, uh, uncertainty that we're facing because of the war in Ukraine and everything else. And that is that now we're really beginning to see that these supply chains are actually critical uh, for us in order to avoid productivity not to decline further. So we now need to begin to address this. And the response to this, of course, is to say, well, let's, let's make sure that we reshore more activity, that we build these domestic supply chains. But that's something that's not going to go be uh, going to be very rapid. That will take a significant amount of time before we get that done. So I think for the time being, uh, these supply chain disruptions are going to be a downer for, for productivity growth. But we need to, again, use technology, think very hard about how we can rebuild the supply chains in a more resilient way in order to be better able to deal with this kind of crisis in the future. And, and so the you know, rebuilding of the supply chain, you know, absorbs capital and attention and, and focus. And so therefore, it, you don't get that. That's what you're saying. And you don't get the productivity gains from that. But but there is this this, you know, this sort of thing that uh, that some economists have talked about that if there is less labor you know, available, and so companies can't get as much labor, but they're still producing the same amount of output you know, with, with less labor, is that a sustainable thing or, or are companies just trying to, you know, trying to eke by you know, with this labor shortage? 
No, I, th I don't think you can deal with labor shortages forever because uh, even if you invest in digital transformation and automation, you know, let's just make it simple and invest in sort of more machines. Let's not get the digital in. But if you would just say, let's have more machinery and uh, you know, that will help us to substitute for all that labor. What we're missing there is that technology is actually changing very quickly. And therefore, we need to have the right competencies and the, the right skills in that workforce. And, and the idea that that is just available or that we can just set it aside and the machines will do everything for us, that will, that will not work. So we really need to look at labor and capital together, particularly when it comes to the deployment of these new technologies. So simply a labor shortage that, that may, you know, then companies may eke by, you know, for what, you know, doing overtime or whatever, that's not a sustainable means of driving productivity. So what I hear you saying then is, you know, it come, does come back to some level of automation and, and digital transformation, which, of course, has been going on a long time. You know, is that it? I mean, should, should we just put a bow on it and say it's all due to automation and digital transformation and nothing more? Well, when you say it's all just about digital transformation, just about digital transformation and not much more, I would say, well, digital transformation is actually really difficult and very complex. So, so what quite often happens is that we confuse digitization with digital transformation. So digitization basically means you, you use new technologies in order to digitize processes. But digital transformations, we actually did a lot of, of work on that at the time at the conference board and our former colleague, Mary Young, once uh, defined this very clearly. Digital transformation uh, is a process by which you leverage these technologies and data that I produce to connect organizations, to connect people, to connect physical assets and processes. And if you think about that, if you think about the word connection, you already see what what a complex process this is actually going to be. I think, there's, I think one of the reasons why digital transformation is not yet paying out itself out in productivity growth is because it is so complicated. So it's certainly not just digital technologies. Organizations need to really rethink their business process. They need to rethink the markets they're operating in. Uh, they need to rethink how they're going to collaborate with partners because quite often you can't do these uh, big projects on your own. You need to think how you're going to reconnect to your supply chains, uh, as, as we discussed a little earlier. So it's just not just digitization. It actually you know, really has to, to pull out the plugs in order to deal with the skills of your workforce, in order to deal with the, the innovations that you bring into your organization and, and the competencies of the organization, the way you want to change that. So if you, if you go back up to 30,000 feet and you go really macro to a global, you know, total global productivity, does globalization meaning, you know, leveraging, you know, resources in the, in, in the most efficient part of the world and so forth and connecting the supply chains. Is that, is that a good way to drive productivity? Well, globalization has definitely helped a lot to accelerate productivity growth during the 1990s and the beginning of, of, the, 20th century, of the 21st century. I mean, it was, it was a big deal. And, and, and it was not just China, but also the rest of the world. But, but as we discussed a little earlier, you can't continue to refine that technique forever. And at some point, you need to think about how your own domestic supply chains and your, your domestic infrastructure of people and technologies and innovations are going to feed into this. And I think that's the point where our that we need to think how we're going to keep that globalization train going, uh, but at the same time also make sure that our domestic capabilities are strong enough uh, to build. Yeah, that. And, 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 and that's influenced, as you said, by the geopolitical considerations. But if, but if, you, you, know, if you had peacetime everywhere and everybody getting along and, and all of that, you, you, know, you, you would sense that that would, you know, that would be a, a good productive way to drive trade. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, I think when I when I talk about the challenges, I'm not saying that we are actually, that we need deglobalization, that would actually make it worse. It's yeah. just the fact that globalization is the point where it's actually optimized, and we are now at, a, at the risk with these supply chain disruptions that are really going downhill. That's exactly what you want to avoid. You want to keep that optimal globalization system. Yeah, and, and we're optimized given a certain, uh, you know, a certain set of geopolitical considerations. Last question, right. you know, COVID, uh, inflation, climate change, all of these things are upon us right now. What impact does all of that have on productivity? Yeah, so, so as we discussed earlier, we're in a really interesting time uh, yeah. between, between this, this installation phase where we, we put all these new technologies in place and the deployment phase where we need to sort of diffuse them and, and use them much more extensively across the economy. And the point is that that transition is usually not smooth. What, what, what the literature says about this is basically that quite often that transition from installation to deployment or from, from you know, a few firms benefiting from this through the entire economy benefiting from it 
usually goes with some kind of frenzy period that, that is followed by some kind of crises. That's what you would usually uh, think to happen. Now, we're not short of crises right now. So you might actually say, well, this is the right opportunity for this. In, in fact, I did think at the time that the global financial crisis was giving us that opportunity already, but I was wrong because I think what happened after the global financial crisis is that we entered in a period of low interest rates and massive liquidity, and that didn't help at all. I mean, you think that low interest rates are going to help investment and productivity, but as a matter of fact, it led to a lot of misallocation, actually a drop in productivity. So we missed that opportunity. It actually made it even more difficult to, to, to make the change now. I think now we're at a point with COVID uh, and then coming out of COVID, where we actually had a lot of digital transformation happening, can we sustain that? But also if the green innovation agenda or the transition to net zero that many countries, so for example, in Europe, where I'm in now, right now, there's a lot of attention for this uh, green transition agenda. Well, that, that is a moment that's almost comparable with the space program or the defense program, where you say a lot of things now need to come together in terms of different types of energy use, new technologies, new ways of innovating, new ways of collaborating that could give us that productivity gain. So the question is, to what extent can we use these kind of tipping points in a crisis to, uh, to grow productivity? And, and to come back to what we discussed a little earlier, looking at the numbers, it doesn't look very good at the moment uh, when we look at the numbers. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that our policies are not quite the right ones to deal with this kind of transition, right? So we need to think about new regulatory environments for competition. We need to think about new tax rules. Uh, uh, we need to think about new ways of innovating uh, across the economy. And, and I don't think that our policies are quite ready for that, that, that new digital age. Well, there's also the transition costs in and of themselves. You know, in the interim, you have- They're very high, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it always takes a long time, but it can just take longer than it has to. And, and yeah. that's, I think, what I'm a little bit worried about. Yeah, very well said. Dr. Bark Van Art, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for joining and uh, goodbye to both Conference Board and Productivity listeners. And, and thanks to all of you for listening in to CEO Perspectives. Every week, I'll be joined by a prominent thought leader to provide insights on the issues of our time. We'll cover leading topics in geopolitics, economics, public policy, environmental social governance, human capital, marketing communications, and more. Please share CEO perspectives with your colleagues around the world. I know they're going to want to listen. I'm Steve Odlin, and this series has been brought to you by The Conference Board. You've been listening to a podcast from The Conference Board, your source of trusted insights for what's ahead. For the latest insights to help guide your business through this time of geopolitical unrest, we have daily and relevant updates on our website at conference-board.org.